Hi everyone, welcome to Itsy Bitsy's live read from Set It Free, a Fallen Angels MC series um, by T. Birmingham. Prologue, bury it deep, 18 years earlier. Winter keep up, Spring shouted, smiling and racing, summer to the top of the hill. Autumn was already there. Then again, for all that she was shy, quiet, Markham, she was also the most athletic. I have shorter legs than any of you, Winter called out, her voice low as she pouted and finally caught up. She was ten, summer fifteen, autumn and spring both eighteen, although spring would be turning nineteen in a month. With spring and autumn both going off to college in the fall, in less than six months it was time to have a little sisterly bonding. That meant, of course, a time capsule, because they were sisters. Two of them were leaving. They were girls, and they lived in a small town in Pennsylvania. A total small town cliché needed to happen. I haven't lived long enough to, to have something important to put in the box we're going to bury in the ground, only to unearth it in 20 years. 18 years, Summer contra contradicted. 20, Spring countered. 18, 20 is, much, is too much cliché for this adventure. Autumn agreed with Summer and spring turned on her. Traitor. Autumn smirked. Hammond leaves in a couple of months. Scoot, scoot, she said. I have a beautiful man to go make out with. Make out with? Ew, Winter said, scrunching her nose. It'll happen to you some day, spring told her. Winter shook her head empathetically. Unless he's a pirate king with a good heart, a sexy laugh, and strong hands, I'm going to have a million can cats and live out my days alone in a cottage by the river. She's been reading romance novels again, Summer inf informed Spring and Autumn, who both giggled with their younger sister. Spring grabbed Winter's hand. Come on, future private qu pirate queen. The spot's over here. Autumn pulled her backpack off and took the four tow trowels out. We really should have brought shovels, Spring advised, taking a trowel getting on her hands and knees with her sisters and digging deep. And who would have carried those up the hill or helped Wynne use them? Summer asked, grunting with effort and throwing a clump of dirt from her trowel to the side and into a growing pile of earth, earth and grass. Not me, that's for sure. Fifteen-year-old girls, Spring had to remind herself. They were opinionated and difficult by nature. She just needed to trust that Summer would move past that stage and grow up. It would have gone faster, Autumn interjected, and then added on Summer's behalf. But yes, poor Wynne wouldn't have gotten to be a part of the adventure. To Autumn, even a leaf falling from a tree was an adventure. They kept digging until Winter stopped, wiped her brow, and asked, Who brought the snacks? No one answered. Summer turned from her spot, grabbed her backpack she had thrown on the ground, and unzipped it to reveal bananas, one large water bottle, and a few granola bars. She threw the bar at Winter without looking, hitting her, hitting her in the face. Jerk, Winter yelled, but she still opened the granola bar while Spring looked to Autumn, and they both shared a smile. They'd be leaving soon, and although it was scary, she would she was excited to try someplace new and find something that would belong to her and only her. Spring loved her sisters. They had been her her life until this point. Autumn was her best friend. Winter and Summer were two, two of her closest friends, even if they were a great deal younger. It was Spring's time now, though. And although she lost her scholarship and spot at her dream school, the University of Connecticut was nothing to sneeze at. And she'd been adopted from Connecticut, her mother and dad had told her years earlier. Spring had always known she was adopted. She looked different than the other Markhams, except her eyes were eerie and exactly like Winner's and her dad's. Her hair was dark with shades of light brown, a brown similar to her dad's too. Her height was like his as well. Her smile, everyone comment, commented, was just like her mom's. Her friendship with Autumn, many said, like the two girls weren't just sisters, but soulmates. She was a Markham, through and through. 
That didn't mean that sometimes she didn't want to know who her biological parents were. It didn't mean she didn't wonder where her burnished brown skin came from, or her thin nose, or her willer, willerly figure. She wondered these things often. Over the years, however, she she come to find that she could wonder at those things and not not yearn for them. She been been ten like winter, and that's what she yearned for: to know how and why and when and where, to know all the people who'd given her up. Her parents had adopted her in a closed adoption, though, and she would never know. So after. Her wallowing preteens, she'd found a new purpose and drive. She was still her carefree, fun self, but she was determined to go to school, get a good job, and meet the man of her dreams. Not a pirate, a businessman. One who was funny and charming, clever and strong, compassionate, empathetic, kind and protective. She didn't know if she'd find him in Connecticut or in Pennsylvania, but she was determined. She wanted so much for her life to begin, and it would. She would fall in love. She would build a home with that man. And finally, maybe one of the most important parts of the plan, she would have little girls with him so that they could have friends for life, just like she had her sisters to share her life with. On that thought, she jumped up and went to the part, pack she had thrown down. One takes an eating break, the other bails, Summer grumbled to Autumn, who smirked but kept digging. Autumn did glance Spring's way in question, though. Spring held up a finger to signal that she'd be just a moment. She dug through her pack, got what she needed, and then went back to the hole that was now close to three feet deep. I think that's good, she said, and then held out the four pens in the notebook. Winter gave me an idea. When did I do that? Winter asked her forehead scrunching, and it was so adorable, her eyes so dark that Spring's smile grew, because she ju she knew just as she and Winter had near black eyes, Spring's daughters would have the same. Maybe one of them would have green or brown eyes like their daddy would, but the other three, because she was totally having four girls, were going to have black eyes just like Spring, her sister and her dad, Markham eyes. She squeezed Winter's arm and pulled her to the side. Winter rolled her eyes and said, Whatever, even as she put her arm around Spring's middle. Then Spring announced, We're going to put our objects in. But, being girly girls, girls of the biggest part order, we're going to do something else. Yeah, and what's that? Summer asked, her surly teenage voice digging at the building need Spring had to smack her little sister upside the head. She preserved, however. We're going to write down our dreams, and in 18 years, she conceded, as she tore four pages out, we'll open our capsule, look inside, and our treasures will be there. But we'll also have these scraps of paper that will prove to us that dreams come true, because we'll have the person and the life we've written about all on these sheets in our real life. Winter's nose scrunched up. That's what you got from what I said? Yeesh. It's all in good fun, Autumn said, grabbing it up in a grabbing up a red pen and a piece of paper. I already knew who I'm going to be married to. Cage and Prince Charming, Summer teased with a laugh. Spring joined in on the laughter, adding her own two cents. I think Lee's more of a Cage and Prince Charming than Hammond. Hammond's more like a Cajun Gothic. Autumn shrugged, still writing on her piece of paper, even flipping it over to write more. I'm in, Summer took the green pen and a piece of paper, scribbing only a few sentences down. Ugh, whatever, Winter said. But I'm writing down exactly what I told you, and he doesn't exist, so I'll be safe from boy cooties. Thank God. They all laughed. Winter still wrote it down. Spring wrote down her dream as well. Then they did their silly ritual, big candles in hand, and walked in a circle, filling in the dirt over the capsule, that held their most treasured possession in a little slip of paper each of them had put their dreams on. They buried it deep. Ten years passed, then fifteen, and then finally eighteen, and on the late March night they were supposed to go back to the place where their dreams lay, none of the sisters remembered. 
Maybe two of them were living their dream, but most likely because two of them were not. Chapter 1. Just Two People. Eighteen years and about a week later. Mia stared at Spring baefully. What? Spring asked, looking around her home. She immediately spotted the furry brown ball that had her little girl Mia's eyes narrowing. Spring's rented home was an old silo, re refurbished, sitting pleasantly in the middle of Pennsylvania farmland and rented out by a local farmer and family friend, Harry Cork. Harry's new silos were on the far side of the farm. Spring's silo was nicer. It was a dark blue with white shutters and windows every few feet to let a great deal of light into the round structure that formerly housed grains. Her dad, George, helped Harry refurbish it so the latter would get renters in and have some extra cash flow. Inside the silo was where Spring's true personality came out. Whites and creams, tans and splashes of burgundy, light blue, silvery accents, artwork with bold yellows, oranges, pinks, and warm colors that helped her move past the cold that cold she seemed to constantly be feeling. On one of her three large comfy ch chairs was a cat. He was fluffy and brown, near as tiny as a kitten, but almost two years old. He had a little scar at the edge of his eye and it cut through his brown fur, revealing a good inch of skin below. Spring sat in her favorite of three comfy chairs, this one a darker cream with a white throw and two burgundy pillows with blue ribbon decorating their edging. Mia, she explained, you didn't see him. He was alone. Mia's eyes turned to look out the window. You can get pouty all you want, sweetheart. He's got the charming little scar, and he was obviously a bit of a runt. He needs love. He needs care, and I, for one, will not have an abandoned kitty all by him lonesome. To this, Mia had no answer, and she seemed to blow, it all, blow out a breath as she returned her gaze to her mother. Please give him a chance, honey. He needed a home. Mia looked to her new friend, Rusty, and then scrunched her nose at Spring. Hopping off the arm of the chair and coming straight to Spring's outstretched fingers, Spring ran her nails lightly through Mia's fur, giving her a good scratch. That's Mama's good girl, Spring caroled to her prissy kitty, who was not a kitty, nor did Mia lo look like one. Her fur was pitch black, her paws and ears white, and her eyes a deep multicolored, mostly green hue. He's going to be part of the Markham family now, and that means you need to learn to love him. Mia took her petting, took her petting, but didn't look to Rusty. Spring made a tickling sound at her tongue, with her tongue to get Rusty to come. Slowly, he moved her way to to sitting at her feet, most likely looking for a treat. She gave one to him from her pocket. Her front door opened, and a tall man with dark, shaggy shaky hair, green eyes, but that little bit of brown and a full growth beard, not all combed and cleansed like her sister's kit's fiance, Lee's, was, and not like the rough but still trim beard that her other sister, Winner's boyfriend, Eagle, had. Call him Casper. Gordon's beard was wild, like the man, untamed. Spring had avoided wild and untamed for a long time, since Sadie, the others in the fall, Fallen a, a, Eagles MC might call him Casper, but he was too solid to be the ghost his name implied. He wasn't Casper to her. She watched the most beautiful thing about Colum happen then. His smile. He took in the sight of her. Cat treats out. Mia climbing onto her shoulder just like a jungle gym rusty at her feet. Claws digging in her nylon hiking pants, and he came to her. Eyes meeting springs, she felt like the center of his world, a dangerous place to be. A dangerous place to, to be because it was always dangerous to want. If you wanted, it could be taken away from you. If you wanted, the nagging voice in the back of your mind would always be whispering. The other shoe was going to drop. Dangerous or not, springs stared at the smile 
at that smile as he waltzed her way. His movements were like a dance, not in an immaculate way, in the way that he moved, like he knew where he was going, but if the wind blew and demanded he turn left, he'd be okay with that. Spring wasn't good at that. She didn't want to be lost in the wind. She wanted her feet firmly planted like an oak tree's roots. She wanted her life secure. He leaned forward and his lips touched hers when he got close. Thank you for listening to this portion.